Hi everyone, I'm Eugene, I use he him pronouns. My name is Thomas, I use he him pronouns as well. And we are doing the strike syllabus. We're in week three, talking about profits, austerity, and worker suppression at the neoliberal university. Yeah, and so last week we were trying to situate things within a sort of broader California context of deinvesting from public education and sort of housing crisis matters and the way those intersect with university education. And this week we're quite trying to look a little bit more specifically at the UC system and profit motive in that context and how it impacts education and workers. So to start, I thought it'd be interesting, maybe, or fun, to think about how the UC system talks about itself and what the values of the system are as they're sort of publicly expressed. And one way to get a glimpse into this is looking at the UC mission statement, which is on their website, but is based on the 1974 to 1978 University of California academic plan, which says that, quote, the distinctive mission of the university is to serve society as a center of higher learning, providing long-term societal benefits through transmitting advanced knowledge, discovering new knowledge, and functioning as an active working repository of organized knowledge. That obligation, more specifically, includes undergraduate education, graduate and professional education, research, and other kinds of public service, which are shaped and bound by the central pervasive mission of discovering and advancing knowledge. And so that was kind of a lot of words, but the kind of takeaway of, in terms of the mission for the UC is education, service, and research as three of the sort of big priorities. So when I move through a couple of case studies and a couple of big glimpses at um, workings within the UC to see how some of these um, ends or goals are maybe undermined or limited by other interests. So this is here, I forgot to take this out, it's basically just for me, but it can govern how we think about the next couple of slides. So I have a few kind of thesis statements that we're going to be working with and trying to unpack a little bit in these examples. And so the first is that the bodies that govern the UC and control its funding, which include the UC Regents, UC Office of the President, or UCOP, and lawmakers are closely intertwined, but have different and often competing interests and flaws. These conflicts um, can ultimately undermine the UC's mission as it's stated in the mission statement. And so to start thinking about that, we're gonna talk about the UC Regents, which is a board of, I think it's like 26 or 28, uh, 26 people, 18 of whom are appointed, um, that govern the UC basically, according to the California Constitution, um, the Regents has full powers of organization and governance over UCs, subject only to specific areas of legislative control. And we're going to look at a couple of ways in which some of their own interests or some of their own actions might undermine or complicate the mission statement we started off with. And so one is a sort of scandal that was like uncovered a couple of years ago about the lavish dinner parties that were being held and hosted by the Regents, for the Regents. So, um, in 2017, the Regents held a $17,000 party the night before voting to raise tuition across the system. Um, in 2014, they held a party that was worth almost $9,000 as they considered a 28% tuition increase over five years. They ended up improving that tuition increase and the ECOP later rejected it, which just kind of shows the way these things are, these institutions are related but different. Um, nevertheless, between 2012 and 2017, UCOP reimbursed the Regents over $200,000 for dinner parties. Um, some regions have skipped these parties, arguing that attendants should have to pay their way to be there and it shouldn't be something funded in the university system. This isn't like the biggest um, scandal in the world, but it illustrative of some of the interests and actions of governing boards that are not in line with the kind of mission set forth in the beginning. Um, the regions also lack diversity, which is a hindrance to the ability of the UC to achieve its goals of education and service. Um, this is a quote I cut up, so there's a quote mark there for no reason. But um, the Regents board is made up primarily of straight white cis men. Um, in 2019, analysis found that about 22% of UC undergraduates were white, whereas about 42% of the appointed board members to the Regents were white. Most Regents don't have backgrounds in education. A lot more of them come from politics, law, or business. And 18 of the 26 who are appointed get appointed to 12-year terms, which means that the body in charge of these regions isn't changing and responding to the need or to the reflect with the current demographics and changes in student body composition. Um, so these are just some of the ways in which the regents is like not super able to speak to the goals of serving and representing the needs of the community. You can't represent the needs of black or Latinx or queer communities if you don't have people representing those, those interests on the UC regents board. 
And the other part of the, the Board of Regents, the, as Thomas said, 18 people are appointed. The ones who are not appointed are people like the governor, the lieutenant governor, the uh, UCOP president. Um, so it's people that are still within the structure of California institutions that kind of make up the board de facto. Um, and so this is a big board and they're not uniform in all their opinions, but just one sort of regions quote that I thought was interesting about some of these tuition raises, which are often, which are often controversial, came from Regent Eleni Kunalakis, um, the California Lieutenant Governor, so not an appointed regent, one of the ex officio regents, who said that I'm concerned that spending decisions are made as if money is no object. And then when the bill comes, everyone shrugs and says, well, if the legislature doesn't fund that, I guess it's just going to have to go on the backs of students. Um, which indicates both some of interest and re um, recognition of the needs of students not always being met by the UC Regents' decisions, but also the role of state legislatures and lawmakers in shaping a lot of, about how the university works and is funded. And to that note, another kind of thing I want to look at is like a mini case study um, that exposes some of the tensions in UC governance is the 2017 audit of UCOP, which was a big sort of scandal when it came out. Um, the audit found that UCOP was collecting revenues from campuses that it was not spending and basically stockpiling and effectively maintaining what the auditor characterized as sort of a slush fund. The auditor um, said that that slush fund was worth $175 million and the UCOP did not deny that they had this fund, but said it was only $38 million. Um, so there's some dispute about the numbers, but not about the nature of what was happening. Um, the UC Regents said that they might have voted against certain tuition increases. If they had known about the slush fund, they are often presented with the image of a UC system that's sort of financially buckling. And so they might not be looking to tuition increases to increase revenue had they known about this fund. Nevertheless, um, for, to their credit, the UC Regents did defend UCOP after the audit was released, by and large. And one um, thing that the auditor found, which shows maybe some of the ways in which legislative interests don't exactly line up with university interests, um, was that the, oh, I should have reversed these, these points, but the auditor characterized the UCOP's research budget as excessive, which is kind of weird if you think that one of the main goals as stated in the statement of purpose is to conduct research. And a professor at UCSB um, in the literature department, uh, who I linked in the notes, I forget his name at the moment, um, but he suspects that part of the reason that research is seen as excessive is because the UCOP frames the UC's mission specifically around education and service, and specifically not around research when appealing to state legislators. So legislators find education and service more compelling um, reasons to give funding and to throw money at than they feel about research. So this is kind of complicated, but just showing the different ways that different interests shape how um, the university is able to function. Which is also wild because the UC is a like R1 institution and is known that as like worldwide that that is what its goal is. Um, and I appreciate Thomas finding these things about the audit because I mean at the picket line for all of our COLA strikes we've talked about this audit number and what it means and so having some background on that I think is important. Also this kind of perception decided to move that that education and service can happen without research is also another sort of perception that's perpetuated on this, but enough about that. Yeah. So those are some of the ways in which sort of governing bodies and people who make big decisions about UC funding kind of conflict and overlap and muddle the UC's main mission. Another point I wanna look at now to kind of transition a bit, that the corporate structure of the UC system, which is substantially oriented around profit, often produces working and learning conditions that exploit laborers and ultimately undermine the quality of education received by students. And so to do get at that, we'll look at a couple of case studies about where we see UC interest and profit. This is kind of like, I feel like a sexy, like whatever headline pull number thing, but salaries is one way we can maybe glimpse the UC's interest and profit. Um, the four highest paid UC employees across all the UCs are athletic coaches which um, is a reflection of athletics' ability to create revenue and profit for the university more than it is, um, I think, a statement to their worth in the university's mission of education and service. Um, Janet Napolitano's salary is $579,000 a year, which is so much. Although, yeah, <laughs> not so much. And in 2017, according to that same audit, 598 employees across the 10 UC campuses earned at least $500,000 in gross pay 
to put that to put that into perspective a bit, the audit found that the UCOP paid excessive salaries to top staff compared to other university systems, including the CSU. So on um, the LA Times, I linked it in the um, notes for the slide, looked at some of the comparative positions and other university systems and how they were paid. And then like at CSU, for instance, some, so UC might have two offices handling two matters that are handled by one office in the Cal State system and the lead of that department will make a smaller salary than either of the two UC systems. It's kind of complicated, but the point is they were paid a lot. And the UCOP defended these salaries by claiming that the UC system is unique among American university systems, um, which it may be, but the, the fact is they are not able to make a case through that with transparent budgeting, um, as the audit pointed out. And so this is all to say that budgets reflect a set of values and priorities and how much money we pay to individuals who are maybe not directly involved in achieving the university's mission statement is a reflective of maybe some profit and non-educational interests. The other comparison to make between the, the UC and the CSU is that last week when we talked about the California Master Plan for Education, they're all linked together. And the three parts, the UC, the CSU, and the community college system are all supposed to feed into each other and make a large education network that serves its students best. So seeing the UC as like fundamentally unique and different from that pulls us away from this educational goal of a public university system for educating our students in the best way that we can. Another maybe more concrete and direct way we see interest in profit among the UCs is international student admission for undergrads. This is another kind of scintillating whatever piece that the LA Times had published a year or so ago about international student admissions at UCSB, which found that enrollment of international students has more than tripled in the last 10 years. And this is not a problem in and of itself, but the fact of the matter is that this increase in admission of international students has not been met with a parallel increase in services or um, resources for international students. Uh, the measures that have been suggested by administration as far as how to help international students have basically involved putting extra teaching burden on instructors rather than generating new services or departments or things of that nature. So the suggestion is that um, professors should be having um, introductory classes for international students specifically and should create new curriculum for them rather than funding new kind of services and new educational um, access. Increased international tuition has been used to offset funding cuts following the 2008 financial crash, which explains why in the 10 years specifically it's increased so much um, it's been seen away as a way to recoup revenue. There's another quote on that from edsource.org. Um, the ranks of non-Californian undergraduates at UC skyrocketed after the 2008 recession to help fill in for state budget cuts. From about 5% of undergraduates to the current 18% of all 222,500 undergraduates in the fall 2018, according to university statistics. That range is now from about 24% at UCLA and UC Berkeley to less than 1% at UC Merced. So it's not distributed evenly across campuses, but also there's been a significant increase that has been a direct response to funding concerns at the UC. Another, so that's one sort of example, this other more protracted one is something I didn't frankly know that much about before I was doing this, and I might have gotten stuff wrong, but I'm hoping it sort of create, illustrates um, something that's been going on, which is the outsourcing of jobs to contract workers across different sectors of labor within the UC. So you see um, up until about this year, I'd spent about two, 523 million a year on outside contracts for an estimated 10,000 low to medium wage employees. And this includes parking attendants, security guards, custodians, cafeteria workers, groundskeepers, and patient care technicians. And so why contract workers? Why does the UC spend so much on contract workers? Well, <laughs> yeah, good question, right? Um, the UC cites temp workers as a way to cut costs and avoid raising student tuition. So they kind of pit the labor sourcing against a, a tuition paid by undergraduates, saying it's kind of a one or the other is how they sometimes position it. Classic outsourcing. <laughs> I love that. Um, and more practically, contract workers are typically paid less than their full-time counterparts and often don't receive benefits. Oh, that's been changing. We'll talk about that as it goes on. Um, Low-wage contract and temporary workers are twice as likely to live in poverty and rely on Medicaid and food stamps, according to the UCB Labor Center. So this is a cheaper source of income for the UC system and one that produces a more vulnerable and less justly compensated workforce. 
there had been, throughout the years, there had been protections against outsourcing labor, but they have been loose and not uniformly enforced across campuses. So again, I have something linked from the LA Times in this slide about some of these protests, and there's specific hospitals and campuses that might not observe or follow all of the contracting guidelines set forth by the UCOP. And it's something that is hard to detect and suss out because our system is so complicated and in so many parts, it can go undetected if these policies are being violated. Having said that, um, the outsourcing job of contract workers has um, resulted in conflicts between the UCs and their workers. Um, they've been protest workers have been protesting these practices across the UCs for years, particularly those represented by the biggest union, I believe, within the UC, AFSC ME3299. I have that whole thing, the abbreviation spelled out in the notes, but I can't remember it, but it's municipal employees, federal employees, and other things like that. Um, so one instance of this kind of conflict between workers and the UCs was that in 2014, contracted janitorial workers at UC San Francisco began organizing to demand equal pay to their full-time counterparts. And this action was prompted in part when the school called for a severe reduction in the salaries paid to these contract workers. At the time, many of the workers um, being affected by this were Chinese immigrants, which is important to remember and think about the kind of social groups that are being exploited for their labor by these systems. And the school retaliated in 2015 by firing many of the organizing workers. In 2016, the fired workers were reinstated as direct employees of UCSF after a two year campaign to get them rehired. Um, but it's important to note that as this sort of dragged out, it was like sort of a dragged out and long process to get them reinstated. Um, let me get put up. Um, as that was happening, the CEO of the UCSF Medical Center received a 5% pay raise, which boosted his annual base salary well over $1 million per year. And this pay raise was increased, or it was um, put in place before the dispute with the laborers was resolved. So there's not the same kind of hesitation to give top ranking CEOs pay raises as there is with lower workers. Um, this sort of continued the conflict between this union and the UCs in 2019, when in, resp in response to union-led protests, the UC regents declared that contractors needed to give their workers pay and benefits equal to that of UC employees working the same jobs. Although uh, the regents made that declaration in November, in the same month, AFSC ME 3299 held another strike action, claiming that the new UC policy did not go far enough to protect contract workers, and as I kind of indicated earlier, these declarations are not uniformly observed. And so there was a fear that this was not going to actually substantially improve every contract worker situation. So in November of 2019, there was a walkout of employees um, that picketed at 10 UC campuses and five university hospitals across the state. And it was the union's sixth walkout in three years on this matter. So this was, was again, part of the prolonged conflict between the union and the UC. And in January 2020, the union and the UC agreed to new tentative contracts with stronger protections for contract service workers and patient care workers, which included salary equal to full-time employees and benefits as well, which is great, but tentative. And just to give this a little bit of context and sort of step out back from this micro example a little bit, um, it's important to be thinking about these workers and these struggles because grad students aren't the only UC laborers who need a COLA. Workers across the UC are united by the need and willingness to fight for more just working conditions. Moreover, thinking about this kind of um, underpaid, undersupported labor, especially to think about right now, because many of the laborers that were fighting through the AFSCME were working in janitorial, medical service, and patient care jobs. Um, these are love, kinds of work that are often undervalued and undercompensated, even as COVID-19 has demanded more work and risk for um, employees in these fields. Had it not been for the tentative agreements reached in 2020, many of the health service workers um, who were working under contract would not have been insured, you know, they would not have had the insurance to access the medical resources of the hospitals they were working um, had it not been for the action of the union. And they would have been un un uninsured or underinsured amidst this global pandemic. And I think that, um, all of this really gets us to a, a larger discussion about austerity and austerity me measures. And we're not showing it in this recording, but uh, linked in the speaker notes of the first slide is a spoken word poet about austerity that um, 
really gets to everything that Thomas is talking about, these cuts that we're experiencing at the individual level while those in charge and the, those at the highest levels of the UC are getting increases in wages and benefits as if they are doing something miraculous that the rest of us are not. Um, so these are quotes from Mervyn Nicholson, um, an academic article called Fuck Austerity uh, from 2013. And I appreciated the article and kind of framing austerity measures and what they mean. And um, it's a very short article. I encourage everyone to read it. It is linked in the, in the speaker notes. But um, austerity means cuts. Cut pensions, cut wages, cut health care, cut education, cut jobs, cut and privatize public services, cut democracy. Ironically, austerity does not do what it claims to do. What austerity achieves is unemployment and social devastation. And something else, it enhances the power of the powerful. Thus, austerity is not some service severe savior. It shifts income upward. It is a means of displacing, disciplining, I am terrible at reading today, apologies, disciplining those who work for a living as opposed to those who own for a living. To the 1%, solving the economic problem means enhancing their power. Education is justified strictly as a means to profits for corporations. Art education is devalued. Student debt rises as student prospects degrade. As the economic crisis of capital deepens, society drifts toward a fascist type solution. Austerity demands duty and self-sacrifice, but as in the logic of fascism, it requires force in order to enforce. And I think what, I mean, we can see that in our current moment um, if you look to some democracies around the world who are suspending their legislatures, just giving all executive power um, to their like to the leaders, this is really a crisis that we are going through, and I think we will be facing severe austerity measures. Um, and as Thomas was talking about, the two thousand eight recession is really kind of the the testing point for austerity in the UC system we see the solution has been to increase international student um, admission, to put a lot of the burden on those students um, in order to uh, make up for these cuts that we're experiencing. Though, at the same moment that all of these, all of these services and tuitions are getting cut to students, um, those in positions of power, those in the regents, those in the UCOP, the top executives and administrators of the University of California are getting raises and in their benefits and their salaries. Um, so this is um, this advertisement, uh, Lila, thank you so much, sent me this last week, um, especially when we're talking about the UC master plan. Um, but yeah, it's an advertisement that says it's Clark Kerr's fault. And this comes out in 2008, right during the, during the financial crisis, saying that the UC system is too good. It does too good of a job that um, we like don't have any money for it anymore. Um, so what we, how we see austerity play out in the UC is that it's shifting costs onto students while expanding pay for middle and upper level administration. So in 2009, directly right after the 2008 financial crisis, the UC regents were proposing a 32% tuition hike, which resulted in um, protests all throughout the state in UC and CSU campuses. Hundreds of people were arrested, students and faculty and staff members, um, and really um, had widespread police violence and was a precursor to the Occupy movement in 2011. Um, we're seeing cuts to the public part of education that turns it to privatization, as Thomas was suggesting and talking about all the ways that the UC system is corporatized and really looks to private outside contractors and sees profits as more important than research, service, or education. And my question then is, is this what we're going to see in this next academic year? Um, here at UCSB, um, well, actually, at all UC systems, we've got an email from the, all of the chancellors saying that everyone has their jobs in staff um, until the end of the, uh, the fiscal year. So July 1st, we'll see if there are cuts to those jobs where the pressure will be put. And my guess is largely will be on um, the lower salary people, not no cuts to the top, but definitely 
pressures at the bottom. And this is from 2009, a UC B Berkeley graduate student interrupting a forum during these strikes um, where he stood up in the middle of the forum and said, behind every fee increase is a line of riot cops. The privatization of the UC system and the impoverishment of student life the UC administration's conscious choice to shift its burden of debt onto the backs of its students. These can be maintained only by way of police batons, tasers, barricades, and pepper spray. These are two faces of the same thing. As students and workers, we are hit first by fees and layoffs, and then by police batons. Privatization closes off the supposedly public spaces of this public university, erecting a wall that grows higher and higher with each passing year. Privatization is the, mental the metal barricades that the riot police set up around Wheeler Paul. Privatization and the police are the twin forces of exclusion. And I think for all of us who have been seeing the COLA movement unfold, um, that, that image of like riot police is with us when Santa Cruz went on strike at first. And so I feel like highlighting these instances of police violence really just highlights what the UC system does and has been doing for years. This is a great graph that uh, is nice to end on that kind of shows um, both the twinned forces of state funding decreasing to the UC and rising tuition to help offset these, these cuts. So we can see really at the, the 2008 crisis, the state funding decreases um, hugely and tuition rises um, to the point that um, like the amount of student, the amount of money owed by each student is, is huge, huge, huge. Um, and a case could be made by that the, the UC system still is a Hispanic serving institution, still serves a huge amount of first generation students and does give out a lot of Pell Grants to its students. Um, and that, be, that being said, as Thomas was correctly pointing out, um, we have higher rates of um, admissions without the same amount of services to these students. Um, I mean, just at UCSB, um, we have access to these services as hampered and huge waiting lines and not enough to go around in for mental and physical health for people, um, which isn't seen as a huge, as a problem for some reason. So I think that talking about austerity really means seeing where where cuts are happening and where benefits are provided. And it's not the larger student body, it is not the, the amount of workers on the ground. So yay, everything is uh, so good. Um, <laughs> uh, so hopefully outlining some of the ways in which profit and austerity and worker suppression have been enacted throughout the UC system in different ways. Um, next week, we're looking again at a sort of more broader, we're zooming out from the kind of ultra local to look at a broader phenomenon that I'm obsessed with and Eugene knows what I'm talking about, but disaster capitalism and neoliberalism, um, which we're very much in a moment of right now, and Naomi Klein is like the coiner of. So we're gonna talk about that next week um, as disaster, as a moment in which big changes are possible, both kind of regressive neoliberal privatized changes, but also possibility for progressive positive change opens up. So we're gonna talk about that next week and hopefully use this as a way to transition for the rest of the quarter to look at examples of protest and resistance and people's movements um, that we can maybe look to as like models moving forward. Yeah, and I think for this week, we highlighted a few kind of micro cases and touched upon some, um, some bigger issues that if you were using this in your classroom, you could really um, specialize in, really look at some of these particulars and kind of zoom in or even zoom out to take a longer look. We're really kind of basing this since the, in like the last 10, 12 years, um, but this is definitely not unique, um, but is kind of an outgrowth of the crisis. So. Yeah, I appreciate you, Thomas, and this wonderful presentation. Yeah, that was so long. Sorry, my slides have so much text. Oh, uh, yeah, thank you. It was so fun. I love uh, it. <laughs> and scene. Yeah.